liberal Christian TikToker claims that Jesus would have been pro-abortion and bases this on Exodus 21. And rapper Lecrae needs to learn what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Now, there are two kinds of people in the world, only two kinds, not black and white, not rich and poor. There are those who are dead in sin, and there are those who are dead to sin. After three nights of unbridled lawlessness across London, the contagion is spreading. The problem is that God has already judged this. He has judged murder already. I don't need to question it. I don't need to ask and wonder what his plan is. We're commanded as Christians not to participate in the works of darkness, but expose them. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, interestingly enough, I got a number of emails concerning some of the liberal (laughs) TikTokers out there. And one specific email, and I've lost her name here, but uh, had... yeah, no, not the TikToker. Oh, okay. I got <laughs> the um, I got an email saying, "Hey, have you noticed this trend on TikTok?" Now, I would not notice the trend because I don't like China having all my information if I can help it. Granted, I think they probably have it through Facebook and Instagram, and you know, when you click on those buttons that say, "Do you accept that they can overrun your phone and and ruin your life?" Uh, you know, just try to say at you know say something like. Hey, I like, you know, this type of food. And next thing you know, that's the ad you have on your phone because they have access to everything that uh, you have on there. But nonetheless, I received this message and I I don't know. I think I've probably TikTok things have come across, especially because a lot of the people who are on TikTok end up sharing it on Twitter and things like this. And I know there's some Christians out there sharing the gospel on TikTok. I am not one of them. I don't typically like to go on there. But I thought this would be good to check this out because there was probably, I think she sent three videos. One looked like, I don't know if he was like a Catholic priest or something talking about doubts. I thought those were really dumb, especially because they put it to like a rap song and they just kind of mimic it and then put questions up on the screen. It's silly business. But then... There was another one, and I was like, oh, that would be more apologetics-based in terms of the nonsense. This lady talks about how, you know, she was given, uh, you know, she went to a a four-year Bible college, and the pastors aren't really telling you they know that these stories aren't really real and that there's two creation stories, which is one of the dumbest arguments ever, okay? It is just one of the dumbest arguments ever. And I remember as a new believer, the first time some liberal tried to throw that at me, and I was just like, what What sort of logic are you using where you believe that in, in chapter one and two, they put two different creation stories? Not that, you know, they emphasize specifically day six or anything like that, But no, there's definitely two different types of stories. And I just thought, this is just so bad. I'm like, is this the best you got? But of course, this is regurgitated. And then you have people making viral videos on TikTok that this is... This is what everyone believes, that Moses didn't write the first five books. This is what everyone believes in scholarship. I'm like, that's so interesting because, you know, I I haven't personally gone to seminary, but I have audited quite a few different seminarian classes. And I've never seen one teach outside of giving the apologetic of understanding that that is such a nonsensical argument and it's just not true. And I said... There's no way that pastors, and maybe there are, maybe there's pastors, maybe that's why places like the UPC are dying, okay? Maybe that's that's true for them because they went to liberal colleges and learned lies. And basically the seminary became a cemetery for a lot of them because they really did lose their faith. And now what happens is the pastoral position that according to Ephesians chapter 4 is supposed to have Jesus as the one placing the pastors into those positions to edify the body that they would not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And instead of having that given by Jesus, you have people that don't know what job they want after 
they're done with high school and say, well, I guess I'll just be a pastor. And then you have people that are not anointed by God. You have people that are not given the declaration by God that that is the appointment that he has given them. And so guess what? They don't meet the requirements. They're not really a pastor and they lead people astray because the blind lead the blind into a ditch. I will now get off of my pulpit for a second here because we're going to play a clip. And I will say this, the first time I ever heard this argument, I thought, wow, that actually is really interesting if you don't look at the original language and if you're King James only, uh, that this argument can have some sort of weight. Obviously, I don't believe it actually has that much weight, even if the King James Bible is incorrect on this one. But there's going to be a reason, and I remember researching and and seeing this, that uh, Rick Warren over there in Saddleback, one of the things that he does is use a million translations. He just used whatever he wants to use in order to what? Make sure that the message is malleable to what he wants to say. So he uses a translation of translation, not saying, hey, this is what the text says. So I looked at how other interpreters placed it. It's just, hey, I'm going to quote from the GEV. I'm going to quote from the NLT, the message, whatever. And I find it very interesting that this is something that is implored by liberals to say, I will find the Bible to say what I want it to say. So you're going to hear someone quoting from the King James here as an argument from Exodus chapter 21. We're going to then read it in the NASB, and it should probably already answer your question, but then we'll go a little bit on the evidence before we hit up on what Lecrae has been saying on secular interviews. So, Tony, let's play the clip. Hey, y'all. Former Sunday school teacher and radical liberal here with a new series. American politics do not exist in the Bible, but if they did, Jesus would have been a liberal. Part one, abortion. While the Bible doesn't explicitly say anything about abortion, it does say something about the intentional loss of a fetus that directly contradicts conservative abortion laws. Let's read Exodus 21, 22 through 25. When men strive together and hurt a woman with child so that there is a miscarriage and yet no harm follows, the one who hurt her shall be fined according as the woman's husband shall lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. It then goes on to say, if any harm follows the miscarriage, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, and so on. This Bible verse is significant because it's differentiating abortion from murder. Causing the miscarriage is a finable offense, but if the woman dies after that miscarriage, then it is life for life because that is actual murder. This contradicts the new abortion bans put in place by Alabama and Georgia. As a part of the heartbeat bill, a woman could be tried for second degree murder for a miscarriage if she is suspected to be the cause of it. Not only is a criminal investigation after a miscarriage extremely traumatizing, but it also directly contradicts the Bible. I'm running out of time, like for abortion part two. Yeah, um, Jesus would not have been a liberal. (laughs) Let's just throw that out there as quickly as possible, especially because the liberal platform, as you can hear, acquiesces to the murder, the slaughter of innocent children. And in fact, in Proverbs chapter 6, it is one of the things listed that God abhors. God absolutely, positively hates the shedding of innocent blood. And the fact is, is this, this woman doesn't actually care what the Bible says, does not actually care what scripture truly teaches because that is why she is quoting this in this form does not look at what the original language says does not look at all even what modern translations say of the original language let me read that text for you exodus chapter 21 22 through 25 so that you can see without my opinion and if i just was reading from i typically like the nasb i'm not an nasb onlyist okay i read from other versions as well and most of all if i'm studying an important subject like just about any subject is when you're dealing with scripture i typically like to look at the original languages and what the scholars have to say on the subject so what does the nasb render as the meaning of that text. And you tell me if there's a little difference between what she's positing here. Exodus 21, 22. And if men, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she has a miscarriage, yet no further injury, he shall surely be fined as a wo- woman's husband may demand of him, and she, he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury... Then you shall appoint as a penalty, life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, I'm going to read a little bit from Stand to Reason's article on this because I think they do a great job. 
And if you guys didn't know, we have the guys from Stand to Reason. We have at least Greg Kokel playing at 10 a.m. on Good Fight Radio every week. So nothing wrong with using some of the resources that they have as well concerning these topics because they do a good job. And one of the big things when it comes to what is being talked about there in Exodus chapter 21 is the fact that the original, the word being used, you're going to learn is not simply just this baby dies, as we're going to see. Here's what it has to say uh, in the article. A word's meaning in any language is determined in two steps. We learn a word's range of meaning, its possible definitions, inductively by examining its general usage. We learn specific meaning within that range by the immediate context. And that's exactly true. It's really, really important. So when we see the relevant passage that is, she has a miscarriage, reads, and I'm not. I'm terrible with Hebrew. I'm. I'm. I'm okay with Greek, but I'm terrible he- Hebrew. But I'll try my best. Wayasa i ladeya, in the Hebrew. It's a combination of a Hebrew noun yaled, and a verb yasa, and literally means the child comes forth. The comes forth. The NASB makes note of this little rendering in the margin. The Hebrew noun translated child in the passage is yaled, yaladim in the plural, and means child, son, boy, or youth. It comes from the primary root word yaled, meaning to bear, bring forth, or beget. Now, this is where it's interesting because this is 103 times it's used in some form of of like coming out. And here's what it says. What's most interesting is that we see it frequently, yasa refers to the emergence of a living thing. For example, Genesis 124, then God said, let their, uh, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their own kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their own kind. And it was so. Genesis 8, 17, bring out with, bring out with you every living thing out of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 15, 4, this man will not be your heir, but you shall come forth from your own body. Now the first, uh, Genesis 25, 25, 26, now the first came forth, red, all over a hairy garment, um, like a hairy garment, and the name was Esau, and afterward his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Now there's a number of examples that they give, uh, Jeremiah 1, 5 is a good one, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's another verse that we go to to show that God knows us in the womb. He's the one who knits us in the womb. And if you murder a baby, which is murder, you're a murderer. And if you allow for the murder of babies and your political standpoint is we allow for baby murder, murder, guess what? That is a single issue that should cut off any Christian from ever voting from a baby murderer. Because the fact is, as I'm sorry, naming names, if you vote for Joe Biden, you are acquiescing to the murder of babies. Yes, I said it, and it's true. That's what you've done when you've decided you're going to vote for somebody who is going to put radical pro-baby murder laws into effect alongside the attorney general who has directly come specifically against somebody who exposed Planned Parenthood for... Guess what? Selling baby parts, exposed them on video, and who did who did she make sure to come after? She comes after the man who exposed them, not the people who are being exposed for the baby murder. Those are the people you're voting for. Well, so when I see people on Twitter and TikTok say, "Well, I'm not a single issue voter. I, I lesser two evils because Joe Biden will take care of the poor." That's like saying, "Well, Hitler really did well for the economy in Germany, so we should go for him." Who cares about the slaughter of these Jews being murdered and being cooked? That's what's taking place when you acquiesce to these baby murderers. And if anyone is is part of it, you're talking about Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. I do not believe, as a Christian, and I'm just going to do a whole show on that. Now look at what's happened. But I do not believe, as a Christian, that you could prayerfully vote for that person and say, well, it's the lesser of two evils. I do not believe that you could do that. I want to point that out because I hope, if you're a young believer that's being absolutely, completely deluded because you can't stop stop going on Twitter and looking at really dumb takes and not understand that the first to plead his case seems right until someone comes to examine him and you keep being told that, yes, it's Christian to vote for a liberal like this who literally will put, I I bet you one of the first pieces of legislation, just like Obama, will be to put money towards murdering babies outside of our country. 
It's something that happens whenever a liberal president gets put in there. So it's something that we need to talk about. Nonetheless, let's go back to the issue at hand. And here's what the article also says. The inductive analysis shows us something important. Nothing about the word yasa implies the death of a child. And that's exactly right. When you look at over and over again, the word usage in Torah specifically, when we do hermeneutics, we do it this way. We look at the author and how the author uses the term. When you see over and over again, it's come forth, come forth, come forth. We see very clearly that that is not whatsoever what is going on there. We are not talking about somebody dying by miscarriage because there is a word for miscarriage in the Bible. It's napel, and we see it in Job 3.16, Ecclesiastes 6, 3-4, Psalm 58, 8, and other places. And so what we want to look at is what does this mean? Does it mean that literally that a, a child is only worth a fine? That's not the case. That's not actually what's going on there. What's taking place there is, Regardless of the, the what's going on in whatever translation you're using, the big thing is it's clear that the killing of a child, and the text does refer to the unborn as a child, is a criminal act. There's no justification for abortion on demand from the Torah. Instead, we have a reasonable, even powerful argument that God views the unborn as valuable as any other human being. And this is why when you read that text, what it's saying is if the baby comes out and there is no injury, and but the husband uh, whose child it is or the father persists, that you should pay him for what has taken place, especially if there's some harm done, some sort of injury. But if the baby dies or the mother, right, then they shall be put to death because their fighting ended up killing a person. So actually, the very text that they are using here, the very text that this liberal is using to say that Jesus would have been a liberal, which basically what implies that he would have supported Abortion, because by the way, the new platform for abortion is not try to minimize abortion, try to have few, and it's sad when you have one. It's shout your abortion, brag about it, tell everyone about it. You know, go on Netflix and make an entire movie about how it's funny that you're going state to state having an abortion. This is the new platform. This is what radical leftism is. And this is what you vote for when you say, I'm going to go in there and click on Joe Biden. It's disgusting. And as a Christian, you should be repulsed by it. And this argumentation is so flawed, especially when we look at the original language and recognize that it's not a miscarriage taking place in that text what's happening is the baby has come forth it's a it's a uh, a pregnancy that takes place and guess what the baby's birthed prematurely and so if that baby does die then that that person needs to die as well who caused it the men who caused the harm so as we switch subjects here we're going to talk a little bit and I'm going to chalk talk a little bit about Lecrae and I want to talk about this because this is an issue for me when people cannot simply answer questions that are given to them because they're given to them by media. And guys, by the way, I've had a lot of people tell me, no, Lecrae's turning a new leaf. He's doing really good now. He had a dark time, you know, uh, and now he's, you know, really, he's really doing, uh, doing great stuff now. And so when I saw this and listened to it, I thought, wow, that's really sad. And this is, I think, August 24th, I want to say, is when the interview was was done and this is for vlog tv and guys please don't click on those interviews unless you have to a lot of them are profane and disgusting some of those interviews but this is him on a very big urban um you know news source uh, mostly big on social media but he does this interview and he's asked a couple of questions and I want to talk about this because I recently, and I will be giving another message concerning pornography uh, to the Rescue Mission guys, and it's something that's on my heart, and it's uncomfortable to talk to men about pornography. It may be uncomfortable, but it's the right thing to do because the fact is, is that pornography enslaves them. They're enslaved to it. So I don't want them to be enslaved to pornography, so I'm going to tell them the truth I'm not going to, as you're going to hear, give them grace and space, I believe. Give them space for grace. You're going to hear that about five or ten times in this next clip. Um, we do want to give grace, and we do want space for that grace, but it's not really grace if you don't warn. That's that's not true. It's not really grace if you don't warn and you don't care enough to tell someone 
that this is wicked. This is not what the Bible teaches. And the fact is, as we're going to go over this clip, what is your standard? That's something you need to ask yourself as a believer. What is your standard for truth? What is your standard for sexuality? What is your standard? Ask yourself that. We're going to play a little bit of this clip, and then whenever I tell Tony, I'm going to cut it off because I can't handle it and keep talking. Tony, play the clip. Well, you're married with three kids. Yeah. Uh, And you have, what, two boys and one girl? Yeah. Okay. So if one of your kids, let's say one of your male sons, comes to you at... 20, 23 years old and says, hey, dad, this is my husband. We're engaged. We're going to get married next month and I want you to be in the wedding. Yeah. What would you say? My thing is like this. I don't, like my brother's gay. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I don't, I don't condemn him. I don't look down on him for him being attracted to the opposite sex. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's something. Same sex. Yeah, or the same sex. Excuse me. I don't condemn him. You know what I'm saying? Like, if anything, we'll, we, we'll dialogue so that I can have a better understanding. Because I don't profess to be like, I got this all figured out and I know the way this should be. Like, I'm trying to read the Bible. I'm trying to have conversations with people and I'm trying to understand, you know, the, the perspective. You know what I'm saying? And I, I feel like anybody who wants to come at a person negatively, like if you was if you was a Christian, and you came at me negatively, then it's like you're not giving me the grace and the space to be a learner. You know what I mean? Help me, you know, give me the space and the grace to learn. And and that's how that's how we move forward. You know what I'm saying? So you could point something out to me and say, hey, this is what it says. Lecrae, you should know better. You should know this. Well, you know, give me the grace and the space to, to take my time and to understand the perspective on it and to understand why these people think it this way. And it, like that's that's the perspective I have. I'm more of a learner and I and I give people the grace and the space as I'm processing and as I'm learning, um, you know, and just walk with people through that. You know what I mean? To just be, be a lifelong learner, man. Yeah, guys, I I think there's a number of things that need to be pointed out here, okay? This idea that next thing you know, whenever the sin of homosexuality comes up, it's we need to have a dialogue because I know someone who's gay, right? I never had to have a dialogue with anyone who was cheating on their wife. Like, I never had to do that. I never needed dialogue to say, hey, adultery is really wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. There was no dialogue needed, okay? And guess what? I've never had to have a dialogue with, hey, let's talk about pornography and whether or not it's sin. I never had to have a dialogue about pedophilia. These things I do not have a, have a dialogue about because the fact is, is that God has already made it clear in his word. What did he say that was so interesting? Like, I got this all figured out. It's not you, Lecrae. It's what the Bible teaches. Who cares what we believe? In all honesty, who cares about Chad's opinion? You shouldn't care about my opinion. You should say, if you don't line up with the word of God, I don't care what you have to say. And that includes society. Society doesn't get to come in and tell God what's what. Society doesn't accept social norms, and then say, okay, now how can I acquiesce this societal norm and make it a part of my biblical Christianity? Because it's not. And the fact is, is I wonder if this is how Lecrae answers this to a Christian. Obviously, he probably would not. Why would we do this? If you have a brother or sister who's fornicating and someone asks you if it's wrong to sleep with someone outside of marriage... Do you say, I just have a conversation. I don't look down on condemn. You don't bring the condemnation. God has already done it. And the fact is, is that if they're practicing and walking in whatever sin, whether it's fornication, adultery, pornography, addiction, which is also adultery, by the way, that's what Jesus says, or homosexuality, we don't bring the condemnation. I don't have that job. I'm not the one who condemns someone to hell and says, you do not come in. You I never knew you. You turned from me. You apostate. I'm not the one who does that. God does that. And he tells us precisely, specifically in his word, those who will be condemned. And when we are cowards, and that's what this is, do not tell me that Lecrae, after how many years has he been rapping? How many years has he been a a believer? No, it's more than five, Tony. Just kidding. Tony, give me the five (laughs) mark for my time. After how many years are you still trying to figure this out? It's the same answer that Lauren Dangle gave. 
It's the same nonsense. You've been a Christian for 13, 14 years, and you don't know the elementary principles of Christ. I don't believe you. In fact, I'm calling you a liar. I don't believe that you don't know and need grace to space to learn what the Bible says on homosexuality. We're not going to get to the full clip, but I want to play a little bit more. But he bring the 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 author, or sorry, the author Vlad TV, the guy asking him the question, actually brings up Sodom and Gomorrah to him. I don't think we'll get to that part, but it's a short interview, it's about four and a half minutes. If you want to check it out, and we'll have the link in the description. But he actually brings up Sodom and Gomorrah and how that was anti-gay, and you just have Lecrae in there, uh huh, uh huh. You know how some people can interpret it that way. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, you know who interpreted it that way? If you want to know why Sodom and Gomorrah, and someone give the context as well. The prophets spoke about it as well, some of the other wickedness outside of the homosexuality. But if you need commentary, just wondering, what does the Bible say concerning Sodom and Gomorrah? Please go to the book of Jude. They engaged in gross immoralities. And guess what they got for it? They got their due judgment and that that should be a fiery example to those who would also engage. And that commentary that the brother of Jesus gave should speak to our lives so that we care enough to actually say something. Grace and space, the only grace that you give should be the grace that God has given. And the fact is that God has given you enough grace to know his word, to be able to share it and proclaim it. And we shouldn't be cowards to say that God knows about sexuality. He's the one who determines it. And I know when somebody's walking in homosexuality, fornication, pornography, addiction, adultery, that they're living a lie. I look at somebody that has fallen into those sins and I don't think uh, devil horns. You know what I think? My heart's broken because they're walking in a lie. I remember when I was once a king in and under the dominion of darkness. I remember that and I remember walking that lie. Let's see how much of this clip we can play before I have to give my last words. Tony, let's play it. Okay, so your son asked you to be in, in his wedding with his husband. Yeah. Would you do it? My thing is this. I want to support my son and 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 let him know that I love him. You know what I'm saying? Let him know that I care about him. So for me, it's not about my son's going to know it's not about a wedding. It's about like my dad being supportive of who I am as a person through it. Now, I, I would like to play the full clip to give him a little more context there. But already, as you can see, is it really supporting your son? Is is that really? Are you supporting your son because you're going to come alongside of him and celebrate his porn addiction? Are you really supporting your son? Are you going to come alongside of him as he cheats on his wife? Is that really supporting your son? I know this is a hypothetical for him, and I'm sure if you asked him if he would like that his son would be gay, I'm sure he would say no. And the reason is, is because he knows it's wrong. There's a reason because the Bible says it's unnatural. This stuff breaks my heart because this is the message that goes out, and this is what happens is people uh, under the, the, the teaching, because that's what it is. Speaking another one another and psalm, teaching one another psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I'm not much of a rap guy, but you, I, you can call it a spiritual song if you want, and that's that's what it's put out as. So, and and I'm not, I'm, I have no, uh, you know, whatever. I have no horse in the game. Is that? A, I don't even think that's the right saying. But, um, <laughs> but I, I just, I'm not. That's not my type of music. But nonetheless, the fact is, is that this guy's teaching people, and this is what he's teaching people. This is going to be seen. This interview is going to be seen all over. Oh, see, the Christians, they support gay marriage too. This guy would go to, a, go to his son's wedding. How on earth could you go and support wickedness? Just put it on anything else. Just attach homosexuality to any other sin that the Bible clearly depicts. Just attach it and then have this sort of audio put right next to it. Any sin, lying, thieving, anything. Do we act this way? And no, and the fact is we're doing a disservice by our cowardice. If we would not speak out to these things, we're doing a disservice to those who are lost to not speak directly to the issue because I love the homosexual enough to tell them the truth. You are about to drink poison. I do not want you to drink it. Let's just have a conversation about the poison. You know, let's give them grace and space to drink the poison. No, let's not. Let's call it out in love, share the truth with them so they would not fall into perdition. Because what we want is for people to come to Christ. And if we're too cowardice to explain the wicked, immoral actions, the unnatural affections, then we can never get to a, a real gospel message and they can never have true victory. God bless. The 511 News with Chad Davidson has been brought to you by Good Fight Ministries, bringing you news and commentary from a Christian perspective. 
This show can be heard every Friday wherever podcast shows are available or visit 511news.org. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to being with you next week on the 511 News.